Hello and welcome to a course on mysticism and psychedelics. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green and uh, I am making these videos um, for, for a number of reasons, um, mostly as a compliment to face-to-face -face classes. Um, at the time that I'm making this video, we've gone through a global pandemic, and when I teach face-to-face -face classes, sometimes people uh, get sick and have to be quarantined um, and can't come to face-to-face -face class, and we need to be able to move on with our lectures. So I'm recording these in advance. They're detailed and written out, and I will provide transcripts for you. Um, but if you're in a face-to-face -face class with me, um, I, when I give these lectures in person, I might be able to um, improvise a little bit more on the script um, or react to future research or questions in the moment. But this at least helps people um, in the broader public who are not in my class. Um, and uh, um, if you've had to miss a class for some reason, you, this allows you to review uh, the material for the most part uh, and be able to get something out of it as well. Um, although you know, in face-to-face -face classes, it's just better because then we can talk to each other afterwards. Um, but definitely the, some of the, the material is very dense and uh, uh, I will jump directly in. Um, so you have a tr written transcript as well. Um, and then of course, for accessibility purposes, that's another reason why I'm doing it this way. Uh, uh, so don't just rely on the uh, YouTubes <laughs> or whatever uh, transcription software. Um, uh, if if you need the transcript for the class, just ask me, and it's it's already written out. Um, and hence, that's I'll be reading through through uh, most of the lecture here. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, this is a class titled Mysticism and Psychedelics, um, and so I will be approaching both of those those. Uh, terms um, separately and together throughout the class. And so we are definitely approaching it from more of a religious studies perspective and maybe a little bit less from the medical or therapeutic side of things. Um, but these conversations very much mesh with one another. Um, I'm assuming a lot um, coming in that the people who are interested in this course have already had maybe some exposure to some of the classic texts like The Psychedelic Experience by Timothy Leary. Um, we will talk about Aldous Huxley and a number of different classic writers. Um, uh, Henri Michaud, the French writer, for example. Um, uh, but this is uh, not just going to be a straight up history course of psychedelic um, the psychedelic movement in the 60s, although we will talk a lot about a lot of historical things um, uh, and in terms of cultural history as well in this class. So I want to start with mysticism in lecture one. Uh, so let's just begin. Welcome. <laughs> um, let's begin with etymology or the word history of the term mystic. In English, our term, word mystic comes from the Greek mustos or mustes, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, which basically means one who's been initiated. Um, we start seeing it in English in the 14th century or the 1300s um, in print, and uh, it shows up as mystike um, or spiritually, allegorically pertaining to the mysteries of faith. Um, we get that in English from Old French because French was <laughs> the French had invaded England at the time. Uh, um, from mystique, which means mysterious or full of mystery, um, um, or directly from the Latin mysticus or mystical or mystic secrets of secret rites. So this is also the source of the Italian word mystico and the Spanish word mystic, mystico. Um, and they all come from the Greek word, once again, mystikos, which means secret, mystic, or connected with the mysteries from mustes, one who has been initiated. So why go through all of that just as a beginning um, to think about mysticism? Well, there's going to be a lot of emphasis if we're talking about mysticism on direct experience of an individual, the person who has been initiated. In the 1960s, uh, 
you know, if you listen to the Jimi Hendrix <laughs> experience, um, uh, he has a, one of his albums is called Are You Experienced, right? Have you ever been experienced? Um, same kind of sort of impulse towards being somehow initiated into psychedelic culture. So what we need to note with respect to psychedelics right off is that psychedelics give a person a kind of direct experience, which is why they get associated with mysticism, among other reasons. Um, so, But just like dreams, which can be very meaningful to the dreamer, um, our psychedelic trip experiences get pretty old after a while, after you've heard a number of them. Uh, um, uh, because they are meaningful to the direct experience of the initiate. <laughs> uh, what's important for research and study of psychedelics in the 21st century, or the early 21st century, as I'm making this lecture, um, is that we need linguistic interaction to hear about the psychic effects that may only be able to be obscure, obscurely measured by techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI scans. Um, so in laboratories and when we're doing research on psychedelics, psychedelics can definitely help brain scientists gain a deeper understanding of how the brain works, but we need the human subject research in order to get the feedback for what is actually going on. Um, uh, so uh, in other words, as I'll say often, rats cannot talk back. And so when we're dealing with psychedelic research, all sorts of ethics around human subject research come into play, along with the politics of drug scheduling um, and uh, um, uh, cultural repression of so-called drugs. We'll talk about definitions of drugs in this class. <clears throat> um, but fundamentally, we're, we, we are working with psychedelic experiences through language. And that is another crossover with mysticism. So as we will see, some of uh, the scholars of mysticism will say that mysticism is itself a kind of writing. It's a kind of discourse. And I will take a discourse analysis approach to how I'm dealing with uh, teaching psychedelics and mysticism. Uh, so. Uh, just some basic history here. Psychedelics were initially researched in the West in terms of research in labs, right? Scientific research. Uh, humans have been using uh, so-called mind altering uh, or consciousness altering substances, although consciousness is a kind of historical term, um, as is mind. Uh, but humans have been, and animals, as other animals, humans are animals, <laughs> have been using uh, uh, um, all sorts of, of um substances that we might call psychedelic um, by modern terms um, throughout from time immemorial, um, which brings up a host of other issues for people who get excited about psychedelics. But uh, in scientific communities in the Euro-Christian West, as I will call it, psychedelics were initially researched in the 1950s and 60s and then became illegal according to new drug schedules in the 1970s. And this happened in the United States with President Nixon. Um, and quickly, um, there was a sort of following um, in the international community um, as well, so through the United Nations. So there, there's a corresponding national element and um, transnational element to the, the restrictive um, policies. Um, and so this was entirely political. Um, it was very much wrapped up in um, the United States influence on the rest of the world after World War II and um, on the foreign policies of various different U.S. administrations. Um, so we can't really separate out the political from the mystical, from the psychedelic in these courses, and it becomes very interesting and also very difficult to navigate all of the different discursive trajectories um, when we're talking about psychedelics. So um, schedule, drug schedules did not exist before the early 1970s, at least in terms of the widespread restrictive sense that we know today. 
Um, a Schedule One substance meant that it was, or and still means this today, um, that that the substance had was had no sort of research value, um, and so not only could you not was it illegal to use substances, you couldn't even gain access to the substances in order to do research itself. And this, of course, creates all kinds of kinds of contradictions for people who are trying to decriminalize psychedelics um, in in the current atmosphere, right? Because you have this period where it's like people make these uh, the government um, or uh, governing bodies have made all sorts of claims about whether or not the substances have any kind of value for research or for ingestion. Um, uh, but there wasn't a lot of scientific basis to back that up to begin with. Um, but yet you then it becomes hard to get access to the substances so that you could do the research to prove otherwise, right? So it creates a kind of vacuum in research. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, lawful research was impossible, but of course th th lots of people were doing unlawful research as well. So now we have a kind of divide in the world of, uh, um, psychedelics where people who have maybe perhaps the most experience in, um, having used psychedelics for treatment, for example, um, we're doing it illegally. And so they can't really say that they were doing it because then they risk losing their medical licensures. <laughs> so we're in a very um, uh, uh, complex moment with respect to the ongoing efforts to decriminalize um, psychedelics and to allow them for research or therapeutic potential or to actually fully legalize psychedelics um, for something like recreational purposes. Um, so, uh, um, quickly, this, all psychedelics were, were made illegal, um, or known psychedelics at the time were made illegal in um, the early 70s. And then in the 1980s, um, MDMA, or also known as Molly or Ecstasy, um, uh, which is not a traditional psychedelic, followed suit into Schedule One restriction. Um, so uh, efforts by the Multidisciplinary Association um, for the uh, uh, Psychedelic Studies, uh, Psychedelic Substances, uh, forgetting the acronym for MAPS, um, is, has been a big leader in policy change, um, especially around MDMA. And so they're an important resource for those of us who are studying psychedelics. Um, uh, but they've been pushing largely MDMA um, uh, uh, in recent years um, because of the potential for um, uh, a therapeutic um, use of MDMA for, for example, one of the big examples is um, returning veterans who've been traumatized in uh, war, for example, right? So what you see are efforts to um, reintroduce a particular substance um, that was used, so MDMA used to be legally used and was used in couples therapy, for example, um, uh, before it became a Schedule One substance. Uh, uh, um, so you see the, all, all sorts of impulses in, in the early 21st century to go the therapeutic route to get a substance um, researchable, um, decriminalized, perhaps available via prescription and then maybe available through um uh fully legal full legalization but with through some sort of licensing like marijuana um or uh tobacco or uh um alcohol which have age restrictions on them right um so what kind of controls or regulations are going to surround um particular substances so the economics come into play um intensely in terms of psych the study of psychedelics so uh in the early 1990s rick strassman's ability to do dmt research along with a couple of other labs in the u.s and switzerland quietly reintroduced psychedelics um, and human subject research. Uh, and so since the early 2000s or the mid 1990s, there's been what scholars call a psychedelic renaissance, a rebirth in the study 
of psychedelics that was that were repressed from the late 60s and early 70s through um, just about the turn of the century and, and part of the early 20th, 21st century. Um, so some of the most famous recent research, uh, as I'm sure many people watching this know, um, have been done at Johns Hopkins and NYU regarding palliative care or end of life care coming to terms with a um, a terminal illness, for example. So the psychedelics don't treat the actual cancer, for example, but they might help the person who um, uh, is most likely going to pass away because of the cancer to come to terms with um, uh, the fact that their life is ending. Um, so the mental health aspects of psychedelics are being emphasized, especially right now. So we following the widespread decriminalizing and legalizing of marijuana, um, which is not a psychedelic, um, uh, in the past decade, psil um, psilocybin mushrooms um, have become decriminalized in many states in the United States, and MDMA has made its way through several clinical trials. Um, and now we have uh, emergent programs training therapists to use MDMA for therapy. So we will likely see um, in the very near future um, a more uh, um, uh, somehow some type of licensed or maybe perhaps prescription use of MDMA and whether that or not that will follow all the way like marijuana into a recreational availability is uh, still in question. Um, we see a little bit of this going on with ketamine treatments as well um, in recent years. So there are many parallels that we can see in the legalization of marijuana and increasing decriminalization of psychedelics, um, but they are not necessarily the same kinds of substances, and that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the emphasis on therapeutic potential for psychedelics saturates the rhetoric of decriminalization, saturates the rhetoric of research, and saturates the legalization for the commercial and recreational use of um, psychedelics. So finally, um, one other aspect, but, um, just as we're sort of coming through the, to the end of the historical stuff here, is that there has been a steady explosion of ayahuasca use and ayahuasca religions from South America that have spread globally and and rapidly um, in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, often overtly combining aspects of traditional mysticism. So for that reason, in this course, we will give special attention to this class of ayahuasca religions um, uh, and, and, and to therapeutic centers that kind of blend spirituality and, and full-blown religiosity, which we'll talk about as well. What's the difference and why do we have these markers for what is a religion, for example? Um, uh, obviously, you know, for my students in university classes anyway, um, as a legal qualification, students taking this class for credit will not be able to use their personal use of currently illegal drugs for research papers. And um, we can't have like people going to jail and suing the school or trying to sue me <laughs> in the legalistic culture that we live in. Um, so for research papers, for anything that you turn in, if you're taking this course for credit, you will not be using trip reports for academic credit. You will not be doing any ethnographic research um, that would be interviewing, say, friends on campus or something like that. Uh, um, uh, so you won't be doing participant observation research where you would be visiting an ayahuasca community and taking ayahuasca yourself, um, uh, uh, any place that it is illegal. Um, so I might teach this class in various different locations and the laws are in flux and changing. Um, uh, uh, so certain communities do have access, legal access to um, using substances, but at least for um, this class on, on college campuses, which is how I'm initiating it. Um, uh, uh, just, just be very clear at the beginning, um, uh, uh, because I know that many people use psychedelics illegally, but we can't, um, uh, we get into legal trouble. And that, and that, and that just is, speaks exactly to the issues of, of 
of of the research for the class and so you might think oh boohoo roger like like what a square you're being um but actually i think that you gain a lot more at the outset of trying to study psychedelics by feeling the restrictions legally speaking that researchers have to go with um because this is not a class in just like you know um your personal tripping experience it's a class in mysticism and psychedelics right so so we're looking at things from a much broader perspective even though at the basis what we often have to deal with is that problem of direct experience um, of the fact that rats cannot talk back so um, our work is going to be a more rigorous look at the historical history of mysticism and claims that people have made about psychedelics and human culture the issue of direct experience will be approached through an emphasis on mysticism so let me say a few things now about mysticism in general before getting into psychedelics and just as lecture one stuff if you're an undergraduate or just coming to this discussion about psychedelics um, from the broader public, some of this language is going to seem really particularly dense. Um, some of the references may seem obscure, but again, you will have the at the transcript for um, this lecture for clarifying questions. And even though I break out a little bit um, to um, do some extemporaneous speaking, um, the bulk of what I say is um, written out here in the lecture. I can't stress enough how welcome your questions are, whether you're an undergraduate, a master's student, an auditor of the class, or a PhD student. I am, as you will quickly learn, an intensely interdisciplinary thinker. Um, so you might be following along with me and then I switch to another discipline and you're, you feel like lost. <laughs> Um, so again, that's why I'm taking so much time to write out most of the lectures and to record them so that you can review them or double check or ask clarifying questions when necessary. My lectures provide loads of context for our course readings. They are a resource for writing and research papers. At no point do I expect total recall from everything I've said in lecture in class, nor will I ever do timed quizzes or exams. Um, I don't find them pedagogically useful. If you have accommodation letters, um, if you're taking this as a campus class, um, for such regressive techniques as timed quizzes or exams, um, uh, you can rest assured that I do not consider them accurate portrayals of actual learning. Okay, so back to mysticism. As Michel de Certeau has tracked in his wonderful study, um, The Mystic Fable, mysticism as we know it is a modern phenomenon stemming from the 12th century and being related to the rise of vulgar languages, eventually becoming a discipline called mystics. Mysticism is premised on a separation from God or the divine that produces an intense and individuating longing that is a deeply personal experience. It's all about this idea of loss and lack, that separation from God. And that's where we're going to deal with an aspect of mystics or mysticism that is intensely rooted in Euro-Christian um religious poetics uh as my deceased friend louis leon termed um uh um, the qualities surrounding religiosity while it may sound strange at first atheism is also an extension of mysticism though it's perhaps a radical critique of mystical thought as my osage friend um and mentor in many ways, um, Dr. Tink Tinker often reminds us um, or reminds people atheists remain Euro Christians. So, wait, why? What is this language like? <laughs> why Euro Christian? So, atheism is an overt assertion, um, as an overt as assertion, only makes sense as a reaction to social systems that historically invoke God. 
So you have to have an idea of God in order to react to be atheistic, right? So atheism is what psychologists call a reaction formation. It is a thought formed to reject the idea of God or religion, which means uh, the thought of God or religion had to precede it. Atheism, as we generally know it, reacts to a largely Protestant, Euro-Christian religious life based on belief and faith. Um, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, who are you know, famous atheist writers, um, remain, in terms of the terms that I will use in this class, Euro-Christians from the perspective um, that I'm going to teach from. Uh, because they operate with this kind of historical trajectory in mind, um, oftentimes based around evolution as well, and, and the, the Darwinian thought, um, which I'm, I'm by, by no means against, but it shows their cultural situation, um, how they form this idea of what an atheist is. Like the ism, first of all, treats religion as something like a belief or belief system, and then the, the negative reaction to God, which not uh, is not universal for peoples around the world, as we will see throughout the course. So um, by negating the frame of religion or God, the atheist avowal merely preserves the notion of God that it intends to reject. So we have to think a little bit about cognitive theory um, uh, when we think of that conception. So what frames our thoughts? What gives a basis to what we call in psychedelic study, uh, studies our set and setting? The assumptions that we bring to the table when we are going to have a mystical or psychedelic experience. Uh, so likewise, mysticism or like mysticism, atheism rests on a kind of separation from the divine that produces a kind of paradox. And so may, hopefully that helps you see a little bit. I mean, we will talk a lot more about mysticism, but I just use that example of atheism to start thinking about like, like, like mysticism actually means a separation from the divine. And a separation from that idea of the divine creates a kind of longing in the subject. Um, a desire to maybe be back at one or in some sort of communion with the divine. So while, um, uh, excuse me, so um, Michel de Certeau's thesis is that mysticism is a modern phenomenon, but modern, we're talking like 1300s to the present, right? Um, this thesis um, uh, will likely provoke questions from students about the ancient world both in the Near East and especially about in ancient I India and um, texts such as the Rig Veda. Um, while, while we will discuss ancient cultures in this class, we will begin by following both Deserto and more recent scholars in religious studies who've critiqued the colonial invention of religion as an always already implicitly Christian category. In other words, I will teach this course from the position that there's no naive approach that we in the 21st century in the Euro-Christian West can take to consideration of the Vedas, the Avesta, the Talmud, etc. Um, there's no naive approach that we can take without being filtered through the more recent Orientalist projects of the 19th century and the global economic conditions that brought about Vedanta philosophy among various mystical philosophies from the Far East between about um, 1890 and 1940. That period is what scholars in literary studies sometimes call high modernism. And it is that cultural moment of the reception and dissemination of ancient texts in the West that most directly informs our discussions of psychedelics today. So it might not seem like it um, uh, at the outset, but a lot of the scholarly work that's happening at the end of 18, the 1800s and the first half of the 1900s um, frames a lot of the discussions that uh, that um, uh, f from which psychedelics um, or dis discourse about psychedelics arises. So in other words, as a teacher of, psyched of psychedelics and mysticism, I am highly historical. Um, 
My lectures provide a lot of historical background and intentionally push away from the idea that we can just trip together and talk about our personal experiences. That might be fine to do like in an ayahuasca ceremony or something like that if that's, if that's uh, what you're into, but that's not what we're doing in this class. Uh, I'm primarily relaying to you the discourse of how people before us have talked about or theorized what psychedelics do in relation to mysticism. That this is called, as I've said, discourse analysis. And if you are a graduate student in my class, you're going to have to do some specific discourse analysis on our class discussions themselves. So from a discourse analysis perspective, the literature published on psychedelics, especially the most celebrated and influential book works, display a tacit yet overwhelmingly Euro-Christian fantasy structure, often expressed as what I will call the archaic revival. The so-called archaic revival um, view speculates that by using psychedelics, we can somehow tap into earlier historical experiences of the human species. Oftentimes, um, this is referred to as some sort of shamanic or existing before the orthodox notions of religion, religion, religion. So the idea is that well, if I take psychedelics, I can have this more purified religious experience that gets us back to before the dogma or the orthodoxy of what we might call organized religions. Um, uh, I will argue that the thinking surrounding archaic revival is not only problematic, but potentially perpetuates white or Euro-Christian supremacy and colonialism. So racism definitely is an aspect um, uh, that we need to think about. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and our modern constructions of race actually come from Euro-Christian fantasy structures to begin with. So we can't even just talk in terms of the color of people's skins. We have to look at the power structures that produced why certain humans might have thought that the color of this, their skin made them better than other people. Um, uh, festivals such as Burning Man, which try to return to a non-monetary or gift economy, are premised on the notion or the idea of an archaic revival. They might be interesting for a variety of reasons, but in this course we need to understand such premises and how they work on people who buy into them, especially when they see participation in such events as somehow offering a kind of liberation to our current society. As I will stress repeatedly, much existing psychedelic discourse is already framed as a reaction to unfair and unscientific drug scheduling. Therefore, people who want to study psychedelics tend to want to focus on the potentially good attributes against a recent history of repression. Discourse analysis allows us to be attentive to the rhetorical motivations that underwrite research and policy. Um, so that's the angle. When I bring in this discourse analysis angle, it helps us be a little bit, um, have a little bit of critical distance between um, uh, the tendency that those of us who might be enthusiastic about the potential for psychedelics in research or therapy or whatever, um, uh, uh, it allows us to, to um, uh, take a little bit of a step back from, from um, our hopes for decriminalization, for example, our hopes for legalization, for example. The Euro-Christian fantasy structure that I'm going to talk about over and over, and says if that is vague to you right now, that's okay. Um, but the Euro-Christian fantasy structure that I will refer to and critique throughout the course is not just the preoccupation of burners or people who go to Burning Man. It often gets reiterated through scientific discourse itself on psychedelics, even during the recent psychedelic renaissance. In scholarly journal articles today, for example, we often see Aldous Huxley or Walter Punky or William Burroughs, Mircea Eliada, and various experts on SOMA cited in long-listed APA or American Psychological um, uh, 
association style references in the so-called hard sciences. Um, uh, in journal articles, um, we'll see these authors um, cited with no critical attention to the historical context or the underlying rhetorical motivations present in the researchers um, uh, or the textual production of the writers who produce um, work on the research itself. And so if you don't know, APA style references have just the author's last name and a date, and then they move on. And this has been important in the medical field because of course you want the most up-to-date research is the most is is the highest premium um, for but uh, for schol historical scholars or um, scholars of cultural studies the most recent information is not necessarily the most highly valued so we have to have that interdisciplinary approach when we come to psychedelics um, uh, so in addition to um, the conservative and genocidal Euro-Christian colonialism that has traditionally informed the so-called war on drugs, which is never a war on drugs, it's just a war on people. Um, uh, um, uh, the genocidal colonialism that's informed the so-called war on drugs has had a devastating influence on both scholarly inquiry and public reception around psychedelics such as such that many well-intentioned researchers on psychedelics today again feel like they must give a positive spin to otherwise unreasonably restricted substances but that creates pro potential problems for the ongoing uh, colonial genocide of indigenous peoples for example which we will talk about later on in the course so you need to know this from day one i can't stress enough that what we have to do is have a critical approach to the discourse itself and to that desire that some of us as researchers or those of us who are just interested in psychedelics we have to question our own motivations um, for our interests um, from day one so much of what we read about psychedelics and their therapeutic value exists because of an idiotic war on drugs that it was never about a war on drugs but about a certain war on or a war on certain people a drug is something that alters the chemical makeup of one's body which is just about anything that you can ingest in your body or put on your skin the eggs and coffee i ate for breakfast today altered my chemical makeup the idea of a drug may be necessary on some level, but it's entirely rhetorical. It's entirely about definitions and, 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 and abstract concepts. Um, what constitutes a drug is always politically and rhetorically motivated. So we need to ask in this class, who gets to decide what is or is not a drug? That said, there are very clear differences between the various substances that people normally think of as, quote, drugs in terms of how they act on human bodies. Psychedelics do not work at all in the same way that um, something like heroin or fentanyl, which uh, uh, is, is, is a big problem in the United States today, right? Uh, psychedelics do not work at all in the same way as something like fentanyl or heroin, and yet they're still scheduled and treated be um, the same way. So there will be a lot to say about um, that in terms of drug policy. Uh, cocaine is not a psychedelic nor is heroin, yet sometimes people who advocate for, psychedelic, for psychedelics promote the idea that somehow psychedelics are the good drugs, the more spiritual drugs, and that cocaine is a bad drug or heroin is the bad drug. Um, and so uh, I'm going to resist in my perspective in this class, I'm going to resist that kind of tendency to hierarchize drugs in terms of their ability to give us access to so-called mystical or spiritual experience. Um, uh, today, um, we are living in, as I make this lecture, the as I've said, the psychedelic renaissance, but few people today are able to recognize the strange nostalgia um, and its hipster or retro variants that resound with romanticization of the 1960s. So um, uh, I'm old enough not to remember the 60s themselves, but to see how the 1960s as a cultural texture has played into um, our civic discourse 
on the so-called war on drugs. Um, so the war on drugs as a governmental policy was introduced in the 1970s, and it produced a habitus. It produced an attitude among um, those influenced by what Theodore Rojak called the counterculture at the end of the 1960s. This was an entirely Western mode of thinking informed by the privileged youth of affluent liberal democracies. It produced rituals of defiance that, along with anti-war, the anti-Vietnam War movement, established what I sometimes call or refer to as enchanted, enchanted citizens who have somehow been experienced. And it's that experience, call it psychedelic, call it becoming woke in terms of your politics. Um, uh, this enchanted citizen um, arises who um, then begins to claim a kind of moral authority above and beyond the state apparatus. So because of one's experience, they are more morally aware than say politicians or the police or the military industrial complex. Um, and this happens through a kind of gnosis or an access to secret knowledge, the initiation into a kind of secret knowledge, right? To go back to our initial definition of mystic mysticism. So this renegotiation of liberal um, enchanted citizenship, of course, rests upon the notion of a self um, who has been um, a certain access to a certain kind of experience that produces what the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has called symbolic capital. So I know this is getting very heady very quickly and that's, please ask questions afterwards. Um, so you might ask of symbolic capital, what, what, what is it? Of what is capital to begin with? Isn't capital always symbolic? Isn't it just that money that kind of exists in the bank or on your credit card statements and your access to, to money, wealth um, somehow uh, part of, of, of something that's always just symbolic? Um, in, in one sense, yes. Um, but what makes uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's concept of symbolic capital um, really important is that it's a kind of lack a perception in the social imaginary that stands in the place of something in the bank. So um, it's, you might think of it kind of like credibility, right? It's the social perception of legitimacy that, you know, my interaction with you is going to, I'm going to gain by hanging out with the person who's more cool. It happens in, you know, celebrity, um, all the time, like somebody gets famous and everybody kind of wants to gravitate around the person. Um, uh, whether or not they're actually really rich, it's the, the attraction of uh, the, the symbolic attraction that gives them kind of legitimacy. So then we get people who aren't necessarily experts, um, uh, but who might have a famous name. This has happened kind of sometimes uh, with, with Michael Pollan, for example, who wrote a really widely read um, book that's beautifully written in some ways, but a journalistic book about psychedelics um, uh, uh, called You Must Change Your Life, or sorry, sorry How to Change Your Mind, something like that. Uh, I don't have the book right here handy. Um, uh, and Michael Pollan is a wonderful writer, but uh, after the book came out, he was giving some drug policy talks. So um, just because you wrote a very popular book on, on uh, psychedelics and did some research, does that make you a policy expert on all drugs, especially um, substances that you did not focus on in your book, for example, right? That's the problem with symbolic capital. Symbolic capital moves the enchanted citizen sensibility beyond the borders of the nation state. Um, uh, so if we go back to the counterculture of the 1960s, somebody has an experience, psychedelic experience that's politicized, they're against the Viet war in Vietnam, they come through their gnosis to a perspective that says, I can critique the United States and the structures of authority because I've had this direct experience. Um, uh, but in doing so, there's what 
um, philosophers such as uh, Gilles Deleuze call a deterritorialization accompanied by a kind of nostalgia or homesickness. Um, uh, my ego expansive ex expansion um, has created this kind of taking me to kind of outer space or mental outer space on a psychedelic trip, for example. Um, and uh, then I've returned from that that trip. So certainly from a literary standpoint, nostalgia, which means homesickness, has inflected the Western aesthetic sensibility since Homer's Odyssey. But the Euro-Christian fantasy structure that I'm going to talk about a lot in this class adds to this an aesthetics of innocence placed onto the notion of childhood. So it's not just journey and return, death and rebirth. It's that with that, part of what Euro-Christian um, fantasy structure does is that it, it, it adds that element of return um, in a broader historical sense, like the archaic revivals return, which is also see, seen and depicted aesthetically and in terms of like returning to a kind of childhood innocence. And when it can definitely feel this way or read this way when you look at trip reports that people experience the way that they look at the world as if they're experiencing it for the first time. And there are some good chemical reasons why that is what is happening in our brains if we do take psychedelic substances. Uh, we are accustomed in the West to think of the child as innocent, but that's a really recent way of thinking about childhood, and it emerged only in the Romantic era in Europe. Um, and so again, it's that Euro element of what I call Euro-Christian worldview. It doesn't have to be Christian in terms of religion. It's all one word, lowercase, um, uh, as I will explain here. So the innocent child is the product of Romanticism and the Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment, capital E, which are but two sides of a coin in what I call the Euro-Christian worldview. In this view, the child is the one lacking experience and therefore implicitly closer to God, in quotes, or closer to capital N nature, which since, since the Renaissance in Europe, has been conceived as a book, the book of nature, for example. Um, or it, nature has been perceived in this cultural way of looking at the world as something to be deciphered and decoded. Science does this, right? Science is very Euro-Christian. Um, uh, it's not to say that it, it, it doesn't give us important things. We just need to look at the implicit um, uh, uh, motivations underlying the rhetoric of science, right? Um, so uh, if this worldview looked at the world as something to be deciphered as a kind of er language um, or a phenomenological baseline, um, then its assumptions about God, its assumptions about nature as, as, a, as an abstract entity with a capital N um, all need to be accounted for. Nostalgia comes into play um, uh, through a kind of this kind of deterritorialization. So somebody has a personal experience, and their they they their mind is expanded. They they lose a sense of body and space, something like that, um, and they feel deterritorialized. De but then they reintegrate. Think of it as the end of a trip. Um, as you. Um, ask yourself right now <laughs> whether or not you believe that children are inherently innocent and when it and it will give you a sense of your own entrenchment in euro christian culture because innocence implies its opposite right it implies this notion of guilt as well it, notions of the thaw um away from the Garden of Eden, for example, those types of um, philosophical or thought impulses are just beneath the surface of something like the idea that children are innocent. As Robert Hemmings, a scholar of children's literature, writes, 
At its very roots, nostalgia is linked with the trauma of deprivation and loss. Sounds like mysticism, right? By the late 18th century, um, uh, Jean Starobinsky argues that the nostalgic person yearns not so poignantly to return to the place of one's childhood, which is a treatment favored by Hofer, another <laughs> writer, but to childhood itself. In other words, nostalgia is a function of the imagination steeped in temporal and spatial longing and the elusive object of that longing is childhood. Nostalgia is a condition that somebody used to be able to be diagnosed with, as with melancholy. And so nostalgia might be a condition that um, accompanies the depression that one feels when one has gone to colonize another country or been taken as a slave or an indentured servant, um, and then they are longing for the place, the, 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 the country of their birth, right? So it's definitely pathologized during the 1700s and 1800s. What we might ask is, quote, childhood <laughs> itself, let alone childhood innocence. Childhood innocence also arose in this year of Christian fantasy structure that I'm talking about during uh, as a product of romanticism itself. So in medieval houses, for example, <laughs> um, without separate rooms, there's no child, there's no nursery, right? Um, most children or um, children had the opportunity to see their parents getting it on, right? So the idea that children ought to be sexually innocent or something like that, um, this does not exist in the pre-modern era um, in the way that, that we often make assumptions today um, through the rise of liberalism. Um, and by liberalism, I don't mean left and right, like Democrat, Republican. I mean liberalism as a political condition that values individuality, which is part of the Euro-Christian fantasy structure. Uh, so with respect to mysticism, we must read not only the focus on the individual that we see in liberalism as a political idea, um, uh, but also the individual who gets saved within Christianity, the individual who makes a kind of conversion to being saved or is baptized, right? That's all about the individual and what has happened to their body. Uh, so with respect to mysticism, again, we must read not only the focus on the individual experience that Michel de Certeau has provided in his works, but also the aesthetics of innocence and a re-territorialization of traumatized and homesick subjectivity. So what do I mean there? I mean that the mystic has gone through some sort of trauma that separated the mystic from their relationship to the divine. Maybe they come back and forth in communion with that, but the longing that's produced in the language of that experience enacts a kind of separation. So we can think about this in terms of the question, what is a subject? What is a subjective I, as like the first person I, I, Roger, in um, philosophy? So in philosophical language, a subject means something like an individual person. It is an idea constructed in Europe concerning the rights that a, one person uh, or a person's body possesses. Liberalism as a political system that we live in and an economic system is always underwritten by a Euro-Christian worldview, which says that every person is in some way special and deserving of a kind of formal recognition, especially by law or by authorities. And we can think about habeas corpus as one of the enshrined examples of a push towards um, liberalism in the early modern era. So liberalism constantly wants to establish something unprecedented as well. What I mean is that liberalism wants to say how something somehow 
nowadays, things are different than in the past. It's a kind of historical reset button. To be sure, by liberalism, I do not mean, once again, something like a Democrat as opposed to a Republican in common U.S. discourse. Both Republicans and Democrats in contemporary U.S. culture regard the individual person as at least capable of possessing certain rights. As an economic idea, liberalism, with that ISM at the end, liberalism recognizes a certain notion of subjectivity. While before the high modernist mantra characterized by the phrase, make it new, or, um, uh, well before that kind of phrase of the early 20th century, um, uh, this was espoused by poets like Ezra Pound um, uh, and his compatriots. Um, proponents of liberalism have long presented the idea that individuals were free from the tyranny of those who govern them. So T.S. Eliot in the early 20th century saw this in his attention to metaphysical poets of the 17th century. Take, for example, the closing words of John Donne's poem, The Sun Rising, the famous poem in English literature. It begins directly, the poem begins directly by addressing the sun. And so it's the, the, these two lovers are in bed and the one of the lovers is addressing the sun um, and argues that the sun um, uh, should, should go away. Um, and and now, um, so, uh, says go away, son, and, you know, announce the new day to somebody else besides us lovers. Uh, the speaker then argues that, um, that with one wink, the sun could go away, except that such an action would mean losing the sight of the beloved. So the power comes on to the speaker of the poem who says, oh yeah, son, first of all, son, go away, wake up somebody else. Then goes into the individual subject. If I just wink, I can block out the whole sun. I'm actually more powerful than you, right, is the rhetoric of the poem. Um, so the speaker then asks the son to um, compare all of the trade in India. Um, oh, sorry. The, the speaker argues, first of all, um, that with one wink, the sun could go away, except that if the speaker did that, then in closing the eyes that block the sun, the speaker would still would not be able to see the lover in bed anymore. So doesn't want to do the winking thing. The speaker Asks, then asks the son to compare all of the trade in India to be worth the beauty of the beloved here, um, who's laying in bed and still presumably sleeping as the, our poet speaker is having these thoughts or this dialogue with the son. So in doing so, the language of the poem reduces the son's beams to the bed they, um, uh, they occupy in the moment. So... These are the famous closing lines of this poem. She's all states and all princes, I, nothing else is. Princes do but play us. Compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. Okay, so I know we've shifted into a different discourse here, right? That's my interdisciplinary approach. Um, but I want us to have a heightened attention to language in this class. Through hyperbole, or exaggeration, John Donne here intensifies the life of the world into the lovers in bed, all the while telling the sun through apostrophe not to shine on them and creating a zone of transference where the lover's communion is simultaneously one with the divine. The sheer egoism 
acts as a reversal whereby the world mimics the lover's embrace. For the speaking lover does not wish to wink away the sun for fear of losing sight of the beloved. So a compromise is struck. Instead of the sun going away, as the opening stanzas request, the speaker instead requests the exclusive presence of sunlight on the lovers. We never escape the one lover's narcissism here, the poem's speaker, but there's also nothing to suggest that the loved one or the lover, she in bed, shares the complaint or the argument or the request that the speaker is having in this dialogue with the son. And so John Donne puts the reader who identifies with the speaker into the impossibility of subjectivity itself through the very conveyance of the emotion of wanting the moment to last. The vicarious reader becomes complicit in the lover's covetousness, covetousness saying that the sun shall only exist for us. But there's a complete reversal in the request of the sun. <laughs> at, the fr at first, the request is that it goes away, and then its request is that it just stay and warm them. Although this poem is not at all about psychedelics, it poignantly addresses the fiction of subjectivity itself and its power to make ridiculous demands of the universe. <laughs> Psychedelics have a tendency to allow us to see the fiction of subjectivity at work. So to the extent that one's own subjectivity is a kind of fiction, our ideas about mysticism, which rests on the idea of an individual subject who's capable of having a direct experience, are also a social construction. At the heart of Michel de Certeau's book, The Mystic Fable, is the argument that what, um, that what we know as mysticism comes from a particular kind of nostalgia with respect to language. Mysticism is a kind of discourse that historically becomes a discipline of mystics. Late 20th century scholars like Don Cupid go so far as to claim that mysticism is itself a kind of writing. But as de Certeau notes with his the founding of the discipline known as mystics, quote, this is kind of a long quote from Michel de Certeau, what is central, therefore, is not a body of doctrines, which is the effect of practices and above all the product of later interpretation, but the foundation of a field in which specific procedures will be developed, a space and an apparatus. The theoreticians of all this mystical literature placed at the heart of the debates um, that at the time opposed them to theologians or examiners, either the mystic phrase, which might be called manners of expression that a mystic uses, turns of phrase or words, ways of turning words, or maxims, rules of thought or action for saints, that is, or for mystics. The reinterpretation of the tradition is characterized by an ensemble of processes that allows for language to be treated differently. The entire contemporary language, not just the separate domain concerning theological knowledge or a patristical and scriptural corpus, ways of acting organize the invention of a mystic body. So this is really heady language. Um, it's a very intense book. What then is the foundation of this field called mystics? For Michel de Certeau, it is fundamentally about a break with languages associated with an intrinsic attachment to the divine. So while de Certeau does not cite him in his book, the um, political um, uh, scholar uh, Benedict Anderson has made a similar claim in his famous book from about 1980, Imagined Communities. The shift towards vulgar languages, towards uh, um, 
uh, the end of the late medieval era or early modern period establishes a kind of nostalgia for a sacred Ur language. If different languages can be used to translate similar ideas, there must be a kind of intellectual fabric, a long or a language as opposed to parole in French. Those are French terms, um, but parole means speech, right? Uh, and the linguist, famous linguist Ferdinand de Saussure used these terms that a long is the entire language, but um, speech is just the speech that I happen to be using at one moment. Um, and so that this fabric of language or long operates beneath individual spe speech um, and that that's the kind of er language that operates behind various systems of meaning. So you can have Latin and Hebrew and Greek or Aramaic, but they become individual languages instead um, um, among many. So instead of being sacred languages. Uh, so think about, you know, like Catholic mass being given in Latin, you know, or Greek Orthodox. Um, uh, mass is still being given, or if you sing Indian bhajans or are dealing with um, recitations of the Rig Veda, the idea is that even if you don't really know the Sanskrit meaning, that you're somehow closer to the spiritual essence of the language of Sanskrit, right? <clears throat> um, in the early modern era, all languages sort of become relativized as just different ways of having a communication system, but that there's something beneath that communi that individual communication system um, that operates as an er language. Uh, you might call it the language of spirit, something like that. So a more abstracted notion of capital L language itself became necessary during the late medieval era. Um, even if the full implications of such a move did not become fully developed until later. So in his account of this shift, Michel de Certeau reaches back to St. Paul and the Christian scriptures and to Pauline hermeneutics in scripture, um, as well as Augustine of Hippo, who contributed to notions of typological and allegorical readings. So we see this clearly with Augustinian fourfold divisions between literal parable, allegorical, and anagogical interpretations of scripture. Paul the Apostle, if you read the New Testament, saw a kind of meaning that rose above one specific language. He applied Greek rhetoric to his interpretations of Hebrew writing, but following Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, um, Augustine of Hippo brought in a particular kind of mystical interpretation that allowed one to interpret what he thought of as God's rhetoric. And um, <clears throat> uh, uh, if you read Augustine, St. Augustine's Confessions, then you see that anagogical impulse very much at work throughout the, that, that famous book. Quote, God's rhetoric worked for these early <laughs> Euro Christians um, like Augustine, um, even though he's, he's operating and he comes from Africa, North Africa, um, uh, he's operating with Rome, right, which is in Europe, and recentering Christianity from the desert to Europe. God's rhetoric worked through a different kind of symbolism that worked in two ways. So, first, there was Signa propria, in which something was used to stand in for something else. Words work this way. These were instituted voluntarily. Second, there were signa naturalia, which were beyond the human codification of meaning. It was therefore necessary to learn how to interpret them on the basis of an intelligence that ascended to the divine will, then descended towards its inscriptions in the opacity of natural things. They were the province of a spiritual or divine hermeneutics. Hermeneutics just means a method of interpretation, right? Thus, there were 
allegoria and verbis, allegory in words in Latin, which could be studied through rhetoric. But there were also allegoria in factus. This, of course, factus, we know, get the word fact from this. This is, of course, an entirely different notion of facts than um, we are used to in um, the contemporary era. In medieval thought, the allegoria and factus were made up of allegoria theologica and allegoria historiae. In order for an, an allegorical fact to appear, there had to be a theological rationality at work that played out providentially in history. So it wouldn't be just the fact that something existed, a plant or a, an animal existed in nature. A plant's existence in nature, in this worldview, would only be accessible as a fact. Its existence would only be able to come to exist through a special kind of communion or access to the idea of divine providence, the idea that God has a plan through which history will then unfold. It's a pretty different way than we generally think about things in the contemporary world. But it's really important because it comes back to that separation that mystic mystics as a discipline and that mysticism as a form of writing is going to give us. Um, in order for one, this is a quote from uh, Deserto, in order for one event or fact to signify another, which would become its figure. A will it to signify is needed, which is no longer that of man, but of God. David, for example, in the Bible, in loving Bathsheba, had no intention of signifying the love of Christ for the church. But St. Paul would say something like that, right? That, like, well, this prefigures this, that Adam is a kind of early version a t an early type, he would say, of Christ, right? So that's where he's bringing Greek rhetorical strategies to his interpretation of Hebrew writing. Um, and then by doing so, starting to treat that Hebrew writing as something that we might call scripture today, but in the ancient world, there is no concept of scripture to begin with. So uh, back to this quote here. Uh, David, in loving Bathsheba, had no intention of signifying the love of Christ for the church. Only providence, with a capital P, ordering the course of events confound the allegorica facti. In a single gesture, providence, God's plan, right, creates things and disposes them in sequences. Like a writer ar arranging the relations between his or her words, the allegorica facti refers back to the unique orator, orator of God, and to his art of speaking, God's rhetoric, right? Uh, according to this manner of thinking, it is the function and privilege of theology to recognize this rhetoric, but that is only possible for a mode of thought capable of seeing things from the point of view of God, who uses the world as his discourse. So only certain individuals, especially in the medieval era, who had the right kind of training could access this perspective that is shared with God, or God's rhetoric itself. And then, as Disserto notes, by the 14th century, it appeared less and less possible to achieve God's point of view or God's rhetoric um, or a point of view of the divine. And this decline accompanies the rise of mysticism. So again, this is where we want to see an intersection between mysticism as we know it and the rise of what we more broadly call modernity. Not your latest iPhone app date modernity, but modernity in terms of uh, this shift towards relativism um, that then accompanies and is exacerbated greatly by the so-called European discovery of a new world. <laughs>
So three important points arise from this for our purposes in, in mysticism and psychedelics. First, the Euro-Christian abstraction of capital N nature. Even in its later romantic form and aesthetics of the sublime, it remains tinged with this notion of the idea of capital G God as a rhetor and God as a kind of author. Think of intelligent design rhetoric today. They still use that type of idea that God must be a somehow designer or an author. This is especially important then with respect to notions of natural law with a capital N or natural rights, including human rights. Second, in the mystic's ability to perceive God's point of view, there is a nostalgia for God's orality, which means that in the one hand, the mystic is often, often puts on the trappings of the illiterate, the idiot savant, the wanderer. In some cases, the wandering Jew is a aesthetic figuration of this idea or the clown. Sometimes the way that people talk about in terms of mythology, the trickster can take on these qualities as well. So third, and this is part of the complexity, mysticism also emerges as a certain kind of performative or deictic writing. Deixis in rhetoric is like language that performs itself. So if you christen a boat, by breaking a bottle over the bow um, before its first voyage and you say with this or uh, when you're in a wedding and with this ring i the wed the the words are saying the action and performing the sacred duty that's what deixis is in mysticism after modernity don cupid um has argued that mysticism is itself a kind of writing um uh, and he says it's a kind of writing that post-structuralist thinkers employ, that's steeped in paradoxes of life experience traditionally made secondary by the attempt within Greek political philosophy to locate a primary basis for living. Celebrating postmodern writers who challenge a fixed center, Cupid also calls for anarchic mysticism to disrupt the fixed religious or governmental institutions. That is, he calls for worldly action arising from a passive or otherworldly experience, some sort of communion with the divine. Mysticism for him can therefore be a model for exploring how intentional passivity relates to social action in society. Cupid's reliance on the text as writing um, perhaps displays a limited and essentially modernist hermeneutics. Um, so for example, he says, mysticism is protest, female eroticism, and piety all at once in writing. Writing, I say, and not immediate experience, that, that modern fiction. Uh, many or most mystics have been persecuted by the orthodox, but whoever heard of someone being persecuted for having heretical experiences? To get yourself persecuted, you have to publish heretical views. And at your trial, for them, for, for them your judges will need evidence of them in writing. Indeed, unless mysticism were a literary tradition of veiled protest, we'd never have heard of it. So again, this is why I use that poet example, the John Donne example, because I want to emphasize that there is something about mysticism that is part of that fiction of the subject um, and is also only embodied through a kind of writing. And it's a particular writing that as a different French thinker, Michel Foucault says, arises in modernity is the kind of writing that you sign your name to and that you can get published for, the kind of writing that you can get sued for, the kind of writing that we can't do, you know, for this class, like that, that if you were doing, you know, uh, uh, if, a, if a school was giving you credit for your illegal drug experiences that the school could somehow then be sued for um, allowing you to, 
to um, get scholarly credit for writing trip narratives, even though the merit outside of the legal apparatus for doing something like that might be totally intellectually worthwhile, but we're still dealing with the legal apparatus, right? So as Roland Barthes, another French post-structuralist critic, called, said it in this famous essay called The Death of the Author, um, he says, the, de the death of the author births the reader, and mystical and divinatory methods are sought when there are no worldly answers to the woes of living. This reading slash writing at the same time, deixis, right, is ritual. It's ancient ritual, perhaps, but it's inflected with the nostalgia and homesickness of for the loss of God that Deserto has described. And I've spent a lot of time talking about this in this opening lecture, but that I really want us to be thinking because so much rhetoric in psychedelic studies is going to want to take us to those archaic revivals that we can somehow get back to this earlier paleolithic type of state of religion. And I have just delved into the late medieval in a very explicit way. We do not think of the world in the same ways today as people in the ancient world. And the lack of a concept of scripture, for example, is another way of thinking about the, the ancient world, that there was no concept of scripture, but we very much have these legalistic notions of, of writing and scripture and mysticism and loss that come necessarily from the historical place that we live in. Now, that's not to say that one position in time is better than another position in time, so I'll, push, I'll allow for flexibility on whether or not that idea of providence or a linear progress of history is something that we should think of. But more important, I want to push against the common idea in psychedelic discourse that somehow by ingesting psychedelics we can have access to the same things that people in caves accessed right now there are definitely uh anthropologists archaeologists like david williams uh, lewis williams who uh will speculate on on the role that psychedelics had in prehistoric human society and there might be something to that for sure but taking a psychedelic for me what i will argue does not automatically get us back into the mind in the cave that's one of the books famously is is titled um, and so the debates around that kind of stuff um, show up throughout psychedel psychedelic discourse. And I'm just being very upfront in lecture one about my take on that kind of stuff. Um, and the reason for that is, is um, a, has to do with historical stuff that's closer to home. So since the 1960s, for example, and certainly with the rise of post-structuralism in academia and post-modernism, mysticism has been conceived as a politically efficacious or effective tool to capture dissenting opinions. Recently, An Yunte, um, who has uh, uh, an academic, has argued, quote, the spiritual or to be more specific, mystical spirituality has long been misperceived as a privatizing affair, a self-absorbed form of the religious experience unable to make an ethical or political offering to the community in despair, end quote. So Yun Tai um, follows thinkers of the Global South, such as Boa Ventura de Souza Santos, who characterize a gap between the West, what I call Euro-Christian, and the rest of the world in terms of an abyssal divide. So Yun Tai argues that mystics concern uh, for the reconstruction of a collective identity share the common ground or um, argues that mystics concern, sorry, for the reconstruction of a collective identity share a common ground, or is it a groundlessness, in the abyss, the idea of the abyss, an unquenchable passion and the failure 
to name the unnameable name of God need to be separated from the passion and the failure to name the unnameable historical trauma from which the fragile name of community is born. So this is a very contemporary book about what mysticism does. Similarly, optimism in the psychedelic discourse has, at least since Aldous Huxley, suggested that psychedelics enable us to have a kind of democratization of mystical experience. In other words, um, An Yudtai, um, in this book, The Decolonial Abyss, which we will read some of in the class, um, says that this thing that people think of as universally mysticism might have something more to do with Euro-Christian or something like white privilege. Um, uh, and so we need to really question that idea of mysticism itself. The psychedelic aesthetics of the 1960s certainly invoked appeals to privileged mystical experience and Gnostic experience, right? That's the, what mysticism partly is, is the, to be initiated, to go back to the beginning of the lecture. To have tripped in the 1960s was to have become experienced, as the title of the Jimi Hendrix's first album uh, uh, suggested. Timothy Leary's rhetoric of turning the world on um, followed by t various manufacturers of LSD who felt that they were doing humanity a favor, like the Brotherhood of uh, Eternal Love, for example, um, certainly went well beyond the therapeutic suggestions that Huxley had envisioned when he turned Leary, um, Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, and Ralph Metzner onto the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or at least the Theosophically Influenced edition produced by W.Y. Evans Wentz, um, that translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So Timothy Leary in the 1960s and late 60s and early 70s became more and more bombastic the more he got into trouble with legal authorities. Many researchers on psychedelics during that time lost their careers or had to make major changes following the drug scheduling put in place by Richard Nixon's administration. And then they blamed Timothy Leary's cartoonish antics for discrediting psychedelic research altogether. As psychedelics have slowly been reintroduced into research in recent years, there has often been a taboo around addressing the confluences of spirituality and psychedelics. Palliative care or end of life care has definitely been a meeting ground, however. So in his ethnography, which we'll look at in the class, Neuropsychedelia, Nicholas Longlitz has, points out that psychedelics like LSD are generally on the wane in terms of street use of drugs due to their non-addictive qualities, which makes them less lucrative to sell and maintain a consistent customer base. Um, something like fentanyl, <laughs> people keep wanting more and more of it, and so they're going to keep spending more money. Yet a resurgence of psychedelic testing in the decade of the brain has proved fruitful both for scientific and religious perspectives. So Longlitz's field work in laboratories in the United States and in Switzerland suggests, quote, that the current resurgence of psychedelic science is not just another story of disenchantment from magic mushrooms to 5H2A uh, receptor agonists in our brains, um, but that uh, the recent um, current resurgence of psych psychedelic science has produced a form of laboratory life that continues to be suffused with the peculiar kind of mysticism that emerged from the psychedelic culture of the 1950s and 1960s. These scientific studies, Longlet's claims, do not result in a presentation of bare life, and he ends up arguing that per, um, perennial might be a more suitable term as a way to address theological questions and spiritual experiences, which continue to serve as a moral motor for the ongoing revival of scientific studies of hallucinogenic compounds. That's a quote from him. <clears throat> 
Psychedelic research requires the use of human subjects. As I've said, rats cannot discuss their experiences with research, re researchers. Thus, we need to have an attention to language, a heightened attention to language that I've tried to express in this first lecture here. Popular books, which are beautifully written, like Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, or Brian um, Mira Rescue's um, The Immortality Key, which is more recent, perpetuate some of the long-standing problems and discourse on psychedelics. That doesn't mean that they're not worth reading, but it does mean that from the perspective of this class where we're taking a critical discourse analysis look at the field, um, it demands that we read them critically. And we need to look at them through the rhetorical motivations that have been produced by drug scheduling, by the so-called war on drugs, by politics, um, by foreign policy, by all sorts of things, by our construction of, of what good science is, of what, con what makes a religion a religion, what is mysticism, all of these questions um, become part of the matrix itself. And so, um, or the matrix of study, not the matrix, the <laughs> movies. Um, I think Longlitz's book is really helpful because um, what he does show is that even in the most so-called hard science, secular, atheist labs, um, testing psychedelics on human subject research, these questions around mysticism and religiosity necessarily arise. So they're part of something that we have to account for, even if we're trying to do it in terms of a scientific study of, of, of psychedelics. Um, and so we need to be able to talk as clearly as we can about these very loaded terms, religion, spirituality, mysticism, mystical experience, what constitutes experience, what is the limit of being of one's body, what is a subject, all of these questions that I have definitely kind of opened up in a Pandora's box sort of way in this initial lengthy lecture to the class. I've tried to get much more in depth about mysticism and about language than maybe people were expecting from a cl uh, class on mysticism and psychedelics. But I've tried to highlight a rigorous attention to what mysticism is, um, uh, as well as a rigorous attention to discourse on psychedelics. We will continue in the next uh, lecture um, with looking at some classic texts especially Aldous Huxley's famous, famous, and, and still frequently um, cited uh, essays, um, The Doors of Perception um, and uh, Heaven and Hell, uh, very closely related that if you have time to check out uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World Revisited, which is a late 1950s essay, and um, Henri Michaud's beautiful book, uh, Miserable Miracle, not as well known among English speakers, but a beautiful account of the mescaline experience. Um, and uh, if you really, really had time, you could look at um, Antonin Artaud's book, it's hard to get, it's not always in print, um, The Peyote Dance. We'll talk about other classics of psychedelic literature in lecture two as well. And I have assigned some uh, current research by the researcher Ann Taves, who has a wonderful book called Religious Experience Revisited, sorry, Reconsidered, um, that uh, was from 2009, but I, I've assigned a, a, a couple more recent articles by Ann Taves, but she's a wonderful researcher in thinking about what mystical experience is, what constitutes a mystical experience, even though she's not a strictly uh, psychedelics researcher. So, um, uh, the research on mystical experience is going to be really helpful for us. So look in your modules if you're taking this class for credit um, for those readings or look at the syllabus. Thank you very much for your attention.
and uh, we will catch up with you next time.